Hey, John Dixon here. Just a quick thing before we start the episode. This season, we're launching Undeceptions Plus, which offers exclusive bonus content to members, whom we're calling Undeceivers. For a small monthly fee, just $5 Aussie a month, you can unlock uncut interviews, extra question and answer sessions, and peeks behind our creative process as we put this whole show together. Don't worry, all our regular episodes will remain free and available for everyone. But in becoming an undeceiver, you're also really helping us out to make this show sustainable and thriving. We'd love to have you with us. It's really easy. So just head to undeceptions.com forward slash plus for more information. Okay, on with the show. Hey, John Dixon here. I've got a treat for you today. This is the first episode of Small Wonders with Dr. Laurel Moffat, a new podcast in the Underceptions Network. You've heard Laurel a few times already on Underceptions in some of our singles, and we're big fans. So I'm excited for you to hear the first episode of her new show. You can subscribe to Small Wonders right now so you don't miss an episode. I hope you enjoy this first listen. See ya. Deceptions Podcast. Small Wonders with Laurel Moffat. On any given day in the main terminal of Grand Central Station in New York City, you will find countless people rushing to and from trains to get where they need to go. And overhead them all is a vaulted ceiling holding the constellations of the night sky. The constellations are in gold and the stars are lit up small lights in a teal blue sky. It'd be easy to miss your train just from looking at the ceiling. But those stars won't tell you where to go, no matter how lovely they are. I went somewhere recently where you can see the stars, the real ones. Joshua Tree in the Mojave Desert. I went for the day, but also the night. If you've ever been to this place, then you'll know how wonderfully stark and strange it is. There's the twisting, furry, choya cactus patches that look like trees only Dr. Seuss could have imagined. There are granite monoliths, boulders as big as buildings and stretches of what seems like nothing, desert wilderness all the way to distant mountains. People go to wilderness places like Joshua Tree for different reasons. To explore, to work, to holiday, to express themselves, to escape themselves or the strictures of their lives. To get away from the busyness of places like, well, Grand Central Station both literal and figurative ones. While I was there, I met other people who had come for the day. There was a couple who were traveling through the park on their motorcycle, trailing their music behind them. The woman had long gray hair, pulled back in a single braid that fell down her back. The man had wavy white hair and a beard. He looked like St. Nicholas, if St. Nicholas happened to be a rough rider in full biking gear. They stopped to eat a packed lunch at the picnic table next to ours. They lived in Montana, I think, 
but it sounded like mostly they rode their bike through stretches of wilderness. There was a man and woman with matching bandanas knotted at their necks and pristine leather boots on their feet, shepherded through the park by a bossy tour guide, who told them what was worth seeing and what wasn't. He took their picture next to a towering rock that looked like a skull, and then packed them back into a touring van and sped off. There were two newlyweds who'd come to the desert in the afternoon to take wedding photos among the trees the park is named for. The groom wore a fur coat and a fedora, the bride a white lace bodysuit. They carried a bottle of champagne and a camera into the desert at dusk. They looked bizarre and beautiful and completely at home. All of us were passing through the desert for the day, in a way in keeping with the purpose of the park as protected by the U.S. Wilderness Act of 1964, a place of wilderness set aside for the permanent good of the whole people. A permanent good of the whole people. Wilderness is good for you. If you had asked me when I was 20 if there was anything about a desert worth preserving, I probably would have said no. At the time, I couldn't really see what the point of such wilderness was. All I could see was the absence of all comfort. I wasn't really what you'd call an outdoorsy person. Back then, I could only feel how hot and dry the desert was, and to my eyes then, how completely featureless it was. I probably would have said, in fact, I'm pretty sure I did say it when I drove across America with a friend when I was 21, what this place needs is some water and some lights. Of course, the moment you start piping water and power into the desert, it's only a matter of time before you add some gaming tables, maybe a couple of slot machines, some cheap lodging. Do that for a bit, and hey presto, you've made Las Vegas. With light so bright, it's impossible to see anything else. Maybe it's worth preserving a wilderness, if only to save us from all the wasteland we're so good at making for ourselves. To protect what is there, even if we can't see it for what it is at first. One of the many benefits to places of natural wilderness is the reminder it offers us of who we are as humans. Far from the comforts of home, the extremes of the wilderness remind us that we are limited in our own resources. We are creatures who are not self-sufficient, no matter how tempting it is to think otherwise. In the cold, we must blanket and jacket ourselves. In the heat, we look for water and shade. All through the day, we need food and water and shelter, and places of wilderness remind us, in the scarcity of such comforts, how much we are dependent on things outside of ourselves for survival. This is both a humbling a necessary thing to know. We would die without it. For all the marvels of my day in the desert, mineral, vegetable, and animal, it was the night that ended up surprising me most of all. For if a wilderness is vast enough, another gift it offers is the sky at night. Joshua Tree is a dark sky park, a place where the darkness of night is preserved, which is another kind of wilderness, I suppose. The places that have the darkest skies are called sanctuaries. Sanctuary from the Latin word sanctum, a holy place, a place that is set apart. While it sounds like the thing that is being preserved is the dark, 
what you end up meeting in such a place is light. That is, all the light that is there that we usually can't see while ever we are too busy making light for ourselves. I waited for the dark. I was not disappointed. Vega, Capella, Jupiter, the setting of Venus, and then more stars, clusters of them, more than I think I've ever seen. There were the familiar constellations, Little Dipper, Orion's Belt, Andromeda, but swimming amidst so many more. The bright bloom of the Milky Way took shape as we watched, with no greater light that I could make for myself, the fine sliver of a fingernail moon shone in the night like a beacon. The number of the stars visible to an unaided eye willing to sit for a bit in the dark is astounding, confounding. I lay on a picnic table in the park and watched the stars move above me. It felt like I was swimming through them. Because of the amount of artificial light we use each night, more than a third of people can no longer see the Milky Way. This includes 60% of Europeans and around 80% of North Americans. This means we cannot see the light that is already always there. Nor can we as long as we insist on lighting our own way in the dark. Emily Dickinson captures some of the wonder of looking at the dark night sky. Wonder, but also strangeness. I saw no way. The heavens were stitched. I felt the columns close. The earth reversed her hemispheres. I touched the universe. And back it slid, and I alone, a speck upon a ball, went out upon circumference beyond the dip of bell. What you are hearing is Dickinson's poem set to music composed by Jonathan Dove. It is part of a larger work, The Passing of the Year, which Dove composed to honor his late mother. It is beautiful, and it sounds a bit like I felt looking up at the sky that night. There are benefits of the dark for humans, for animals, including the fact that when you sit in the dark, you are gifted with a surprising amount of light. And the brightness of the light in deep darkness can show us how faint, how small, how very weak and narrow our own attempts at lighting our own way are. I was speaking to my friend Tilki recently about how she had come to believe in God, why she believed in him. We were standing on a subway platform waiting for my train. It would come at any moment. She told me that she had gone through a hard time in life. The particulars were harsh and difficult. It was, in many ways, a wilderness of sorts, an existential one. And it was in that wilderness because of that wilderness that she said she came to the end of herself, the edge of her own circumference. It was only when she came to the end of herself, she said, that she found the love of God. My train came. I gave her a hug and said goodbye, and the train carried me into the night under a starless sky. I turned her words over in my mind, the end of herself. There's a double meaning in it. The end as in the limits of, but also the end as in the reason for. What my friend found at the end of herself, at the limits of herself, was the reason for herself, the presence and love of God. 
she found in the wilderness the permanent good. My train rattled on. It began to snow. And even though I couldn't see them, I knew that above the snowflakes falling through the air, above the clouds, far above the light the city burned for itself, the stars shone and the night sky glowed with all the light that is already, always there. Podcast.